What's up everyone? Welcome to another episode of Code Porn. Today we're going to be looking at some debugging techniques using breakpoints in Visual Studio. Now breakpoints are a very important part of the debugging process because they give us a way to specify a specific stopping point in the execution of our applications. Now when these breakpoints are hit, our application will stop executing and at that point Visual Studio will take over and give us the ability to do things like examine data such as local variables, run commands, and control the execution flow of our application. Now the problem with breakpoints is not all developers know about breakpoints and how to use them. They're still using techniques like message boxes or console.write line and out of the developers that do know about breakpoints and do use them, they aren't aware that Visual Studio provides some enhanced features or advanced features uh, for breakpoints that are very useful and that's what we'll be focusing on today. So let's jump over to the demo. So first things first, I've got uh, some demo code here. Let's go ahead and set a breakpoint. To set a breakpoint, we select a line that we want to stop execution on. And then over here in Visual Studio, we have this gray sidebar here. We can click on that. And when we do, we see that our line has been highlighted with red and we've got a little red circle icon over here that lets us know that we have a breakpoint set at that current location. And that breakpoint will follow that location as we navigate our code. We can also do the same thing by selecting a line and pressing F9. It's just the Visual Studio shortcut and F9 to delete the breakpoint. So now that we have a breakpoint, we need to be able to manage them. And we can do that in the breakpoints pane, which is found under the debug menu under Windows and breakpoints. Now inside this breakpoints pane, we can see a list of all of the breakpoints that we have within the entire solution that's currently open. Now at this point, we only have one. So let's go ahead and set another breakpoint. Okay, now we see our new breakpoint. Now what this breakpoint pane does is gives us all the information we need about all the breakpoints in the application and also gives us the tools that we need to manage them. So we can delete breakpoints, we can delete all breakpoints matching the search criteria. We can enable or disable all breakpoints. This is handy when you want to run through the application, but you don't want to hit any of the breakpoints, but you also don't want to delete any of the breakpoints because you're going to want to re-enable them later. And then to re-enable them, we just click the button again. We can also export the list of breakpoints that we have. This is useful if we're debugging a certain scenario with a certain set of breakpoints, and we want to be able to save those so that we can reuse them later on. We can click this button here, export those to an XML file, and then when we're ready, we can use the import button, select our file, and have those automatically loaded in for us. Now by default, when you open up your breakpoints pane, you're probably not going to have all of the columns that you see here. So to change that, you can click on the columns drop down and just pick and choose which pieces of information you want to see. Now at the moment we only have two breakpoints, but in a large solution it's very common to have many, many breakpoints. But as you can see, these aren't very useful. They're not very helpful. They tell you which file the breakpoint is in, the line, and the character, but that's not always really helpful. What exactly is this breakpoint there for? What is its purpose? So we can help that by right-clicking on the breakpoint. We can also do that over here on the sidebar and choose Edit Labels and we can add some labels to our breakpoints to make them more meaningful. So in this case, let's just say this is in the do work method. But let's say this method is actually 100 lines long and we have 10 breakpoints. Just adding that this is in the do work method is kind of helpful, but not completely. So let's add a little bit more information. We'll just say console.write line. Now again, you can put in whatever it is you want in this label. It's just there to help you describe what this breakpoint is there for. Click OK. Back on our breakpoints pane. Now we see under the labels column, we have all of the labels that we typed in. So not only do we know what this breakpoint is for, we can also filter out breakpoints using the search box here. Let's type in do work and filter that out. And now we only see the breakpoints that match the search criteria. Okay, let's clear our search results. Now if you wanted to actually navigate to where this breakpoint is, let's say we're in a different file somewhere else, we can use this button here to go to source code. 
and it'll put our cursor in that file. If the file is not open, it will open it for us, and then navigate directly to that line. You can also just double click on them and it'll do the same thing. Now again, if you're in a different file, let's say you're in app config, but these breakpoints aren't in app config, and you can see which file they're located in over here in the file column, and also by their name, you can just double click on them and it'll navigate you right to that breakpoint in the file that it's located in. Okay, well I want to run this application, but I've got a breakpoint that I don't really want to hit because it's not useful, and that's the one on the do work method call. So I can disable that by just unchecking the box. And you'll see the difference here. We've got two breakpoints. This one is active. It's a full red circle. And this one up here has been disabled, and we know that because it's now a hollow circle. You can also click on the breakpoint, and it will re-enable it. And you click once more, and it'll delete it. But we just want to disable this one. So let's go ahead and run. And we see that we've hit our breakpoint. Down here in our breakpoints pane, you'll see that now the breakpoint is bold. This tells us that we're currently stopped at this breakpoint location. Now you notice over here we have a hit count column. It says break always. That means we're always going to break when this breakpoint is encountered. And it gives us a count of how many times the breakpoint was hit. So if we continued once more, now we see currently hit twice. But this can be a problem because we are in a for each, and we are going to hit this breakpoint for every single item in the collection that we're enumerating over. And maybe that's the expected behavior. That's the behavior that you want. But in this case, we have far too many items in our collection, and we're only interested in stopping when item is something that we're interested in. So we can configure this breakpoint by right-clicking on it and setting a condition. Now in the condition pane, we can type in any condition we want. So we'll type in item is equal to apple. And then our options are is true. So whenever the item is equal to apple is true, then the breakpoint will hit. We can also use has changed so that once the expression is evaluated, if the result ever changes, then it'll break. So we'll just keep is true for now. Now we can also type in just regular C sharp code. So we'll type in dot equals an item, and you can see we get some IntelliSense because it knows what item is. Okay, so we'll type in item equals apple. Now normally, if we hit run, we would hit the breakpoint again, and we're currently sitting on grape. And grape is the second item in the collection, but we want apple. So normally the next one would be orange, so let's hit run and see what happens. Okay, so we've hit our breakpoint again, and now our item is apple. We didn't break on orange, so the for each code continued to execute, and the breakpoint expression was evaluated every time that it was hit, but it only stopped execution when the item is equal to apple, which is what our expression is. And then if we continue again, we don't hit the breakpoint again, even though there were two additional items. So that's how we set conditional breakpoints. Now you notice that our icon has changed over here. It's got a white plus symbol in the center of it, and that's to denote that this breakpoint is conditional. And you can also see that in the breakpoints pane. Now one thing that I want to point out about conditional breakpoints is they can be really slow. So if you have a lot of code or you have a large collection that you're enumerating over, it's really going to slow on the execution because that breakpoint expression has to be evaluated every single time that it's hit. So don't be surprised if your application starts to slow down. Okay, so another type of condition that we can set is a hit counter. So in the hit count configuration dialog, we have a couple options. We've got this drop down here. So we can set this breakpoint to break always. So every time that it's hit, it's going to break. We can break when the hit counter is equal to, and then we can provide a value. We can break when the hit count is a multiple of, or if it's greater than or equal to a number. Let's go ahead and just choose when the count is equal to, and we'll set that to four. And then down here in this dialog, you'll see the current hit count, which is zero because we're not actually running. And you can reset that if you want. So let's click OK. And then you'll notice that we still have down here, we have a condition when item equals apple and the hit count is equal to. So let's go ahead and 
undo our condition by unchecking that. Okay, so now when we run it, we've hit the breakpoint. Then you'll see that the current hit count is equal to four. And our item is now Kiwi. Go ahead and take off hit count. Set that to break always. Another useful option is setting a when hit condition. Now in this dialog, we have an option to print a message. Now what this will do is it'll actually take in this expression here and print that out to the output window. This is really handy if you're trying to debug something and you need information. Like for example, in our for each loop, we want to know what the items are but we don't want to add any additional code like debug.writeline or console.writeline. What we can do is type in a message. Now in this message, we have a few different expressions that we can use. We can actually print out local variables and we do that by wrapping them in curly braces. So you can see we're wrapping item. That'll be the value of the item in the for each. We can also use some of these predefined macros down here, and Visual Studio gives you a list of those. Let's just say we wanted to print out the actual method. We would use dollar function, and Visual Studio will resolve that to whatever the currently executing method is. And then you have an option here. You can continue execution. So that means that the breakpoint won't actually be hit, but we'll still print out a message. Or you can uncheck that, and the breakpoint will be hit and also the message will be printed to the window. We'll go ahead and continue execution. Click OK. Now you see our breakpoint looks a little bit different. Now it's a red diamond instead and then our actual line of code is highlighted in black and then down here in our breakpoints pane you can see what it's actually going to do. I've already got the output window open so let's start this and you can see now we have a list of all of the items that we enumerated over it was automatically printed out for us every time that breakpoint was hit now in previous versions of Visual Studio I believe up until Visual Studio 2010 these were called trace points so if they look familiar that's because they've been merged in with the functionality of breakpoints Now another useful feature is the filter option. What filters do is allows us to restrict when the breakpoint is going to be set in certain processes and threads. Now this is very useful in cases where you want to set a breakpoint for a certain piece of code that may be executing in a multi-threaded application, but you're only interested in certain threads. And so we can do that by specifying a thread ID or the thread name. something along those lines. But for this demo, we're actually going to restrict the process name. Okay, when we do that, we see we have another conditional breakpoint here. Now when we run this from Visual Studio, we're not actually gonna hit that breakpoint. Now you can see over here that we have a broken breakpoint for some reason, and you can tell that always because it's a hollow circle with a explanation point icon next to it. Now the message says that the breakpoint is not going to be hit because the filter has a condition that hasn't been satisfied. And that's because we are currently in our VS host process. So instead what we can do We're just going to add a read key at the start of the application just to give us a chance to actually attach the debugger to it. We'll rebuild this. And then we'll run the process directly. So we'll go to Tools, Attach to Process, and then we'll find our target process in our available processes list. 
click attach. And now you see that we have our breakpoint is not broken. And in our application, we'll hit a key because that's the line that we're sitting on. And now we've hit our breakpoint because now our process is no longer running through VS host because we ran the process directly. Now, since we're stopped at a breakpoint, it'd be a good time to show you the go to disassembly option. We'll take you to the disassembly and navigate you to where the breakpoint would be equivalent to the line of code that we've broken on. All right, that's it for this episode. Be sure to subscribe to our channel, follow us on Twitter and Facebook, and visit CodePorn when you have nothing better to do. If you have an idea for an episode or you want to be a guest on an episode, send an email to codeporn.show at gmail.com and let me know. Thanks for watching.